Try this at home. Find someone you admire in a class but don't know too well, otherwise there wouldn't be any unexpected reward. Tell them you're doing a neuroscience experiment. Ask them in exactly one hour to text you something funny or provocative. When the text comes in, hear the incoming text sound, but do not look at the text. Think about what your mind was thinking during the previous hour, and at this moment, the anticipation of what did this person text me, and recognize that sensation in your brain before you read the text. Then read the text. You probably at that moment experienced a letdown as the anticipation felt better than the reward. This reward system is easily hijacked by modern substances like cocaine, nicotine, and so on. These drugs cause a spike in dopamine an order of magnitude higher than what naturally occurs in our bodies. We store that experience in our memory with a link to the pleasurable body feeling, which encourages the user to then seek the drug repeatedly. And other behaviors not considered drugs per se, like gambling, sex, spending money, playing Fortnite, are fueled by the same neural mechanism. After each upward spike, dopamine levels again recede, eventually to below the baseline. The subsequent spike doesn't go quite as high as the one before it. Ultimately, repeated use of a dopamine-generating activity results in tolerance, which requires more to get the same feeling. It's via a similar mechanism where people can get addicted to gambling, computer games, marital affairs, stock trading, etc. They become habituated to higher baseline stimulation and then need more novelty and more unexpected reward to get the same neurotransmitter feeling. This is why church bingo five years down the road results in junkets to Las Vegas and many other similar examples. One personal example in my history is I used to manage money for very wealthy people and one of my millionaire clients called me whispering from his wife's delivery room about to have their child, where's Intel stock? The unexpected reward of a stock quote update shouted louder his brain than the far more important but slower, less stimulating, at least for him, birth of his own child. Okay, let's put some context on this. In our ancestral environment, we also had frequent spikes of dopamine. A successful hunt, a dalliance in the bushes, a defense against a lion or neighboring tribe. But between these moments, there were long hours and weeks on the sun-baked savanna, time to dream, tell stories, look at the sky and birds and animals, etc. All beautiful things, but very low in intensity versus what we have today. Today, the intensity of experience from alcohol, recreational drugs, video games, social media, stock options, etc., is significantly higher than the day-to-day -day experience of the eras in which our brains evolved. And now we're surrounded by it. There are two key points here. Number one, our supernormal stimuli smorgasbord has much higher peaks in our brain than our ancestors were regularly exposed to. The A versus the B in the graph here which means we can easily become habituated to consumption and other addictive behavior. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, we're so surrounded by 24-7 cheap prevalent stimuli that even the low points in our neural day are probably higher than the periodic spikes of our ancestors, shown as A versus C in the graph above. We are not naturally resetting other than when we sleep, but even then, how many of us have our phones right next to our beds in case we need to check Instagram or play Candy Crush in case we can't sleep? The average teenager spends nine hours a day staring at a screen, whether it's an iPhone, computer, or television. This is at least a mild form of addiction, because as time passes, the level of enjoyment goes down and more stimulus is needed. This isn't the fault of the teenager. It's a cultural phenomenon where we're giving the technological equivalent of cocaine to 12-year-olds. Yes, iPads target the same neural pathways as cocaine. So even if we're not addicts, the prevalence of high stimulation technology has the ability to alter our behaviors. Imagine being faced with a series of binary choices throughout our day. A healthy and not so healthy choice, like exercise or watch TV, eating a salad or a cheeseburger, doing your homework or playing a video game, 
saving the climate or taking a jet to the Bahamas. Over time, as we become habituated to higher baseline stimulation, these choices no longer are 50-50, but become weighted towards the easier, higher dopamine stimulation choice. And over more time, the more boring and more healthy choices become more difficult. So eventually, despite our well wishes to do better tomorrow, today often results in pizza, beer, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, football game, nap, Facebook, email, nap, beer, than we might normally have chosen without such habituation. One problem with 24-7 opportunity for stimulation is we become habituated to dopamine instead of serotonin, oxytocin, and some other slower, more social neurotransmitters to comfort us. This we can change as individuals and as a culture. Here's a bizarre, profound, and a bit unsettling example of this. Last year, there was a false incoming missile warning to Hawaii, and there was a plunge in pornography traffic versus that time in the average Saturday. To be expected, right? People thought they were going to die in a few minutes. But when the tweets came out that the missile warning was in error, there was suddenly a 48% jump in porn traffic versus the average Saturday. We're not going to die. How can I get the quickest, intense, feel-good neurotransmitter I can to offset my recent fear and discomfort? Apparently, reading a book or making a sandwich wasn't sufficient. Perhaps an upsetting example, but a glimpse into our culture? Okay, this is a long video. Let's wrap this up. Life didn't evolve to be happy or for any other reason. It just evolved. Pleasure is a set of evolved reward mechanisms which shape behavior to seek more of an unexpected reward because historically that led to better survival. A rat with electrodes implanted in its limbic system will press a bar to self-stimulate to the exclusion of all else, enduring electric shock and thirst and finally starving itself. This isn't good for the rat, of course, but it feels good to the rat. Its brain works exactly the same way that ours does, seeking stimulation rather than end results because that's the programmed gene agenda that worked in the past. That rat didn't watch this video, however. Being aware how our brain works is the first line of defense against shifting or avoiding certain behaviors, replacing them with other positive neurotransmitters like the social ones of serotonin and oxytocin. The end of this whole video series will have some suggestions on how to use intelligent foresight to combat some of modern culture's siren songs of consumption and high stimulation tech. Okay, one important final side note. Dopamine is singled out, and rightfully so, for its role in addictive behaviors in our culture. But dopamine isn't bad. Not remotely. Without dopamine, we wouldn't leave our beds in the morning. It's the motivation to do a task chemical. Dopamine isn't the problem. It's our culture's approval of and hyper-focus on high-stimulation activities which over time lead to shorter attention spans and, for some people, addictions. That's what we have to be aware of. There's no problem with cool games and gadgets and social media, only that they have the potential to overwhelm activities of meaning and productive cultural pathways. As we'll see in the third Nexus series, also they have collectively large negative impacts on the environment. Okay, quick summary on dopamine supernormal stimuli video. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter linked to motivation, reward, and memory. Our modern culture has a multitude of ways that can hijack this ancestral reward system. The wanting feels stronger than the having. Unexpected reward is a key driver of behavior. Here's some things to think about as a college student. Observe your cravings and why you do things. Part of metacognition. Try to build in technology breaks to your routine and notice how you feel during them and after them. Your brain is your biggest asset. Think about it, value it, protect it. Okay, we've now talked about sex and drugs. In lieu of rock and roll, we're going to revisit how social we are and the importance of groups and group identity in modern culture.